All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Bishop Corner. Tonight is an awesome night to be on the program. Uh, my name is Philip Reed. I'm the producer for the Bishop's Corner, and I am glad to see everyone who is watching on Facebook and YouTube. Yeehaw! You have joined. <laughs> Great program tonight, and uh, we're glad to have you. We have our, our author and speaker, uh, Tana Session, and uh, she's going to be joining our panel tonight. We're very excited to have her. And at, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our host, none other than Honorable Bishop Dr. Herbert Stott. Thank you very, very much, Phil. I really appreciate that. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Bishop's Corner. My name is Bishop Dr. Herbert N. Scott, the Chief Prelate of the Liberty Hall Cathedral of Praise right here in good old Brooklyn. Well, tonight, my friends, is a very, very special night. Oh yes, we have the guest tonight, author of the book, Working While Black, A Woman's Guide to Stop Being the Best Kept Secret. We welcome tonight Dr. Tana Session to the program, a renowned author and speaker on the subject of race and cultural diversity in the, in the workplace. Welcome, Dr. Tana Session. We just want to thank God for your presence, young lady. It's indeed a honor to have you coming all the way from the West Coast. God bless you richly. God bless you richly. Question, yeah. Dr. Session, please just tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here on the Bishop's Corner. It's truly an honor. Um, and I'm looking forward to this evening and spending time with you and, and all of your guests here today on your multiple platforms. So again, thanks for having me. Um, so yes, I'm Dr. Tana M. Session. I'm an organizational strategist, international speaker, and best-selling author. And first and foremost, I, let, I like to let people know I'm a wife and a mother. Uh, so before all the accolades and everything else that happens in my life, um, those are my two most important jobs. Uh, and sometimes I do pretty good and sometimes I don't. <laughs> depending on the day. Um, but I've, I have over 30 years of human resources experience. I've been in the diversity and inclusion uh, uh, industry or field, if you will, since 2007. And I spent 30 of those years as the top HR executive for different organizations. And luckily for me, six years ago, I was able to create my own path and become an entrepreneur. And now I do HR consulting for different uh, public companies as well as, as government agencies and private industries. Um, where I'm going in and helping them with their HR through the lens of diversity and inclusion. Dr. Sessions, certainly it's a pleasure to have you here this evening on the Bishop's Corner. Well, guess what? We're here to talk about your book. Oh yes, Working While Black, A Woman's Guide to Stop Being the Best Kept Secret. Dr. Session, what really inspired you to write on this particular subject? Well, a couple of things really. I had someone that really pushed me in this direction. So I've written books before, this is my fourth book, um, but I never wrote one that was as transparent and authentic as this one. Um, so I had a colleague or friend, uh, Dr. Lois Frankel, and she wrote the New York Times bestseller, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And I was sitting on her board of her nonprofit. And she said, Tana, you know, I have a lot of black women that come when I do speaking engagements about my books. And they oftentimes are asking me for advice on how to handle certain situations. And a lot of these I've never faced before because first and foremost, I'm not a black woman. And she said, based on your background and your experience, especially the fact that you've been, you know, the head of HR for different organizations, I can only imagine that you probably have a story to tell that can help address some of those issues that they've come to me with. And so she challenged me to write it. And I actually took people on a journey of my experience in corporate America, especially as I got into the leadership roles where I was the only black woman. I was the only one who looked like me, sometimes the only woman sitting around the table. And it wasn't always a friendly experience. It wasn't what I thought it would be when I got there. You know, as they say, it's very lonely at the top. Yes. And so I shared some of my experiences through that book. And then I was able to connect with other women to have them share theirs. So different industries, different phenomenal black women in all different uh, aspects of their career, all at the top of their game. 
But what I found out was that we all experience a lot of the same issues. And so in the moment, you think you're the only one going through it. Sometimes you think you're crazy or that you're imagining things. Um, but when speaking to them, I realized, oh, you know, we need to be able to provide strategies and, and make this a toolkit that other women can use as if and when, because they probably will if they're Black, encounter some of these same issues. And so that's what inspired me to write the book. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Okay, thank you very much. Well put indeed. Dr. Okay. Session, what are some of the obstacles you find in corporations as it pertains to minorities or African Americans? Yeah, so first and foremost, I would have to say that um, it starts really from the recruiting process, right? So having hiring managers that either have a bias, whether unconscious or implicit, about who they think is the right person for the role. So that's where it really starts. And I go even further to say, oftentimes it even starts with the actual job descriptions, because sometimes there's language in there that is not, um, that doesn't lead someone like me to think that either that's an organization for me or that I qualify for that position because they put so many requirements within the job description. And then once you get in the job, if you're lucky enough, the system itself is not set up for you to succeed. So you don't have the same support systems. You don't have mentors, you don't have sponsors. And then you reach a, a wall or a plateau where you end up not being able to grow your career as quickly or as swiftly as others that don't look like you. So mm -hmm. that's what I've experienced as you know being the head of HR as well as my own career path. Okay, beautiful. Question, after a reader, has completed reading your book, what would you like the, them to take away? Well, first and foremost, I want them to know they're not alone. So like I said, it's lonely at the top. And oftentimes you think, you know, a couple of times you may think, well, am I crazy? Am I imagining this? I want people to know that, you know, microaggressions are real um, because a lot of times that's exactly what we're experiencing as marginalized people. And then secondly, I want them to be able to take away some action in terms of what they can do to turn things around for themselves, learn how to navigate these systems that weren't built for us to succeed. So we can figure out how to win at this game. Oftentimes the rules change once we're in it, um, but how do you figure out how to change those rules or how to catch up? You know, what does it look like to have a sponsor? What are some of the characteristics you should look for as well as a mentor and an advocate? What does that even mean? And I tell people it's important to know how to build your own personal board of directors. So I talk to uh, individuals about what that means and how to do it successfully. Dr. Sessions, thank you very, very much. Listen, we will indeed be coming back to you shortly. We, of course, would like to welcome our audience right now. Thank you very, very much for tuning in to the Bishop's Corner. We also would like to thank God for our panel that's with us again tonight. We thank God for the Reverend Dr. Heather Francis, that's with us. Thank the Lord for Apostle Lucian Roas. Thank the Lord for Bishop Neville Woolistan and also Pastor Richard McKenzie. So glad to have you all here with us tonight. We are on the subject of racism in the workplace. And as we have been discussing this subject of racism, question. How are we to address this issue when we are confronted with it? I want to put this question, first of all, to our panel. We'll start with Reverend Dr. Heather Francis and then over to the Apostle. Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. It's so good to be back in the Bishop's Corner again. I look forward to this session every week. I look forward to interacting with all of you. It is a tremendous blessing. Um, particularly, I want to give God thanks for our doctor session for coming on. She's such a, an accomplished woman of God that I really just give God thanks for her. Uh, in response to your question, how do we address it? Um, I want to just go back or revisit an experience that I had, particularly in corporate America. Uh, many years ago, um, I worked for a Fortune 500 company, and I had gotten to the place in my life that I achieved a great deal of knowledge and experience in finance. And I was the only black woman in a very large company, the only black and the only female in the finance department as an accountant. And um, it came time for my review 
And the young man who sat me down to do my review, he wasn't the original person that hired me. He actually inherited the position. Uh, he sat down with me in the room and as he pulls out the paper and we're about to go over my progress, he looks at me and he says, you know, if I was here when you were hired, you would not have gotten the job because I don't hire roaches. And so he was referring to me as a roach, meaning a black person, not particularly a woman, but a black person. But on top of that, here I am a black woman. And I believe that, uh, mm -hmm. Women are, we experience the greatest variety of microaggressions in corporate America, as Dr. Sessions said. 40% uh, of Black women are questioned with their judgment as compared to 36% in white women and 27% in Black men. That's a fun fact. Uh, it means that when I did my work, I presented it with a spirit of excellence, meaning that when I submitted my spreadsheets, my financial spreadsheets. I checked my numbers over and over and over again to ensure that whatever I was presenting, there were no questions by my male counterparts and let alone my white male counterparts. So I was on top of my game. I made sure that I crossed every T, I dotted every I, I did exactly what was expected of me and even exceeded that. I was salaried, so therefore I put in the extra hours to accomplish my job. And, and I made sure that if I had to be there from nine to five, I was there from seven to seven. So I put my time in just to make sure that no one had anything negative to say about me. And so I'm sitting there in front of this manager who's telling me that he wouldn't have hired me because I'm a roach. And immediately I became very offended. And of course, my, uh, you know, my response was to walk away. So I got up, I walked out and I immediately went to the human resources department. And there was one young lady in there that was a sister an African-American sister. She wasn't the head, but she she was second in line uh, under the manager. And so I thought, if anybody is going to have my back, this young lady is going to have my back. And so I go to her. I tell her what happens because that's the protocol that we should follow in corporate America, right? If you've experienced racism, you should address it. So you go to human resources. You go to the system that has been put in place so that you can voice your grievance. And so I told her what happened. Of course, I was a bit angry, emotional at the same time, because this is my livelihood. At the time I was a single woman, I'm paying my, you know, I'm, I have to pay my bills. I have to pay my car payment, my insurance. I have bills to pay, but I'm not going to be belittled by anyone, by any means, none at all. And so she looked at me and after I calmed down, she said to me, you know, um, I understand, I, you know, I feel you, uh, you know, I empathize with you. I'm really sorry about what happened to you. But my suggestion to you is for you to go back. You have an excellent job. You're making really good money. You're in a great position. And so I have to tell you what that felt like. It felt as if I was being granted a privilege of being in this social club or this arena of men uh, that, you know, that work in this environment. And despite my education, despite my achievements, despite my experience, despite my training, I was being told that I need to shut up and go back to my office, apologize and get back to work. So to answer the question, how do we address it? You speak out. But what do you do when your voice is not being heard or you're in an environment where you, they're, they're not going to help you because they themselves are in fear of whatever the repercussions may be? So personally, I, I believe that you should address it. But there is a problem because with me, I had to walk away. I gave my uh, resignation and I walked away because I never felt so black before, if I can use that terminology. I, and in that position, I never felt black, Dr. Sessions. But at that moment, I felt black. And so I said, no, I've never been made to feel like that before. So my response was fight or flight. Yeah, I, f I fought, but guess what? I'm going to get out of here for my sanity. So I left. <laughs> Dr. Heather Francis, question. Now, I tend to know your temperament. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when someone called you a cockroach? 
Can, can I be honest, guys? Be I, honest. Be I, honest. I, I was re- I was pissed off. I was angry. I wasn't. I, I'm gonna keep it real. I was not thinking about Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I, I was very very upset, and and literally, I I I even got. Um, payback. I'm going to be honest with you, Bishop. If if it was now, I would not have done it. But you have to think back. I mean, I'm, this is back when I was like maybe I don't know, 23, 24, around that age. And of course, that's you know more than 25 years ago. So of course, I wouldn't do it now. But you know what I did? I was actually so angry about it that I sat and thought about retaliation. I wouldn't do that now, you know, <laughs> guys, I don't recommend it, but I was very, I'm gonna be honest, listen, this we wanna be real on this show. We wanna be real. So Bishop, you know me, I was really angry and I had acquired, uh, um, what do you call it? The little, um, the little, the little, um, guys help me what is that the little stick that you put in the thumb drive the thumb drive so i was responsible for doing the bank reconciliations for 124 stores at the time i had 122 complete and i had two more and i was responsible for coming up with the policies and the procedures and how to actually go about doing it for the loss and prevention department and so it had never been done before of the history of the company no no one actually came out with a manual on how to do it. So they asked me to do it. So from the first day I started, I was there for about seven years and I was there for a long time. And so I did it. I started there when I was young and I worked my way up and, you know, I was really proud of what I had achieved. And for this man to look at me, beautiful black me and tell me I'm a roach. What? I said, you know what? When I was done, Bishop, with that thumb drive and my complete manual, it was over a hundred and something pages. I had it all on the thumb drive. And the day I was leaving, the entire company, over 2,000 people, gave me a going away party. And he was the only person that did not come. And it was maybe, I want to say maybe 50 people were Black out of the entire 2,000 people. And he made sure he left a note on my desk that said, you know, please make sure that you leave the thumb drive. I said, okay, no problem. And when I was ready to leave Bishop, I took my briefcase, I took my papers, and I took my thumb drive. And that was my payback because I was angry. And that was my way of getting back. So I was upset, Bishop. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> Listen, we thank God that at that time the rapture did not come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Apostle Roas, please read in that same question, sir, would you please? Apostle Roas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Scott. It's certainly an honor for me to be here tonight. We want to welcome Dr. Session and the panel. Um, the workplace, the workplace is supposed to be a beautiful place. You know, you know, some people, Bishop, would rather I mean, we'd we like to get paid for our, what we work, but some people would rather get less money and be in a place where they enjoy the workplace or where they love what they do. You know, so um, it was Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese writer, who says that work is love made visible. Work is love made visible. And so when a man goes to work, he want to be respected. He want to be honored. You, you, you don't want your manhood to be challenged. Um, Richard uh, Brunson, um, I think he's the CEO of Virgin Atlantic. He says, train people well enough so they can leave. Treat them well enough that they don't want to. Mm. And, um, I love work. You know, work is in the Bible. But working in a place that not... You you're not treated based on on performance you you you, you but, but but on preference, and so in America it's it's a problem. Um, you know um, what's the population of of blacks in America? Fourteen percent, about forty million. And you know there are only three black CEOs of fourteen five hundred. Mm. In the history, there were two women, none at present. And I'm not just here to give you a bunch of statistics. In the NFL, for example, there are 70% of the players are black. Only three coaches, no owner. 
Mm. The ND, there's about 80% colored. One, one principal owner, you know who it is, Michael Jordan, Charlotte Bobcat. So now it's not just the days of Jim Crow where there was white only bathroom, but it seemed like there was only white only corporate America. It is said that of all the CEOs in the Fortune 500, 91% are white male. Isn't that something? So, so, so we face these things and we, we got to speak about it. We got to bring awareness. I had one personal experience in the workplace and I was so stressed out. I heard uh, Bishop Wollaston once says that you, you want to leave, but you think about you the breadwinner and bringing home the bacon to the family and, and you got mouths to feed, so to speak, and, and, and you just can't leave. So sometimes work can be stressful where you are treated less than. I'm retired five years ago from the New York City Department of Sanitation. So I work for the Lord. I work for the church. Uh, I'm, full, I'm, I'm, you know, but uh, when I retired five years ago from the New York City Department of Sanitation, I had, a, I had some encounters and I had a white supervisor that didn't treat me right. I remember once I was on um, light duty working and um, when you go to work there, you have to take your look at all the garage and look at the parking lot and make sure everything was all right. So I was on light duty. And um, when we all gathered 200 men, when we gathered there in the, in the, in the, in the 12th age shift, he would make fun of me. But not only did he make fun of me, one night he sent me home. I was working the 12th to 8th shift. He sent me home at two o'clock. And then one day he had me out in the rain. I mean, he could have told me sit in the truck or sit in the car. So he was giving it to me. And when the guys, he was a very funny guy. But when the guys came together to work, he would tell them, at that time, I was driving a BMW, a seven series. That was about 12, 13, 14 years ago. So what I'm saying is, is like, I'm not supposed to have a BMW. So he says, guys, let's take up an offering for Pastor Rojas so he can pay for his BMW. So I spoke to him about it. And he wasn't paying me no mind. So I was like a, a, a laughing stock. I said, I'm going to take care of this. And you know, sometimes in life, you know, education is powerful. It's the great equalizer. And not everything you got to cuss and scream and carry on. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take care of this. I pushed the envelope a little bit. Now, I was the pastor of the church, so I made sure I, I wrote a letter. Now, the letter, I used the church letter heading, and I made the secretary put it together nicely. Very good. And when I came to the shift, and he made all the fun of me, I said, can I have a word with you? I have a present for you. He said, what's that? Talk about <laughs> I said, I got a gift for you. And I gave them a letter. But the letter was not closed. It was, the envelope was open. I said, give this to the chief. I said, but you can take a look at it. <laughs> Try to destroy it because I got the original. <laughs> he went in and he read the letter and he stayed quiet. When everybody left the garage, it was just myself with him. He said, Rojas, we need to talk. So oh, you want to talk now, huh? <laughs> so he began to say, Rojas, listen. I didn't mean what I say. I was joking. You know, I'm not going to bother you for the rest of the night. You could do whatever you want. Okay. So he gave the letter to the chief. Next day, the chief called us in the office, the union delegate, and he had to go downtown the next day. And he started calling all the guys that I woke with. He said, can you talk to Rojas, please? Tell him to drop this. I, I got two girls. I could get fired for this, man. Come on. Don't play me like that, Rojas. I didn't mean nothing. I'm not racist. <laughs> well, I tell you what. He was begging me, literally almost tears in his eyes, to leave it alone. I eventually forgive him. Dr. Heather, I forgive him. <laughs> against him, you know? And guess what? They gave me back my six hours. And from that time, he never messed with me again. As a matter of fact, he transferred out. And guys told me, Rojas, you caused him to transfer. And, and, and when the supervisor now give the guys problem, they say, Rojas, Pastor Rojas, can you give us a letter? <laughs> so, you know, I took care of that. Some, uh, I'm going to say this in close. About, uh, after that, about two years ago, after he had left the garage, I went to work in Brooklyn to a different garage. And when I walked in there, somebody said to me, good morning, Rojas. And I looked, I didn't recognize him because he was a heavy set guy. He, he lost a lot of weight, so I didn't recognize him. I said, oh my God, that's you? He looked at me, he put his glasses down. He said, Ross, I ain't messing with you. 
you know, and after that, we became good. So what I'm saying, sometimes you got to stand up. It might sound funny, but there is, there is problems in the workplace and sometimes it's stressful. You leave the job. I was so stressed. He sent me home. I feel less than. I couldn't leave the job, but I took care of business. So what I'm saying is people are speaking up more than ever before. Like I said on Sunday, I did a sermon with 10 lepers and the Bible said they lifted up their voice and they cried to the Lord. And, and David said, I lift up my voice and the Lord heard me. And so we have to speak more than ever before of what and take be quiet anymore. To be quiet is to be complicit. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, man of God. Listen, it's been said that problems never solve themselves. We have to confront. We yes, definitely sir. have to confront. And sir, you did. God bless you. <laughs> Bishop Wollaston, talk to me. Same question. Pleasant good evening, Bishop Scott, oh, and please. to my esteemed colleagues in the panel, special uh, greetings also to uh, Dr. Sessions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sessions, for taking the time to be with us this evening and also for the work that you do and continue to do. Um, certainly, you are an inspiration to many, especially women of color, and for that, we thank you so very much. Well, Bishop, we've all had an experience at one point or the other where when it comes to racism or discrimination in the uh, workplace. For me, it was a little challenging, no doubt. You know, I think it was Kenny Rogers that said, you gotta know when to hold, <laughs> know when to fold, <laughs> know when to walk away. Know when to run. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it was an experience that, again, had an impact negatively, obviously. I was, this is 30, 25, 30 years, at least 35 years ago. Here I am, young, married, couple of kids, my wife, um, only breadwinner, and um, had an unfortunate, several unfortunate situations in regards to discrimination and, and harassment. Um, I had to make a decision, a concerted decision as to what do I do? I'm the only breadwinner. You know, do I, do I walk away? Do I stay on with my ego being bruised. I remember one time, I'll never forget this. I remember one time the supervisor said to me, so at that time, maybe two, three kids and, and only one car, by the way. So that time my wife went back to work. I had to drop, drop the kids to babysitter and drop her to work and get to work for eight o'clock. Yes. The joker told me, if you late again, guess how late I was? Two minutes. <laughs> dos, this is dos, uh -huh, whatever, two minutes. I was late for two minutes and he told me, if you're late, I thought you get like five minutes grace period, seven minutes grace period. Child, let me tell you, did I not? It was, I mean, you think about this. You, you're, you're trying to keep the roof over your head because that's what you're taught to do, you know? So back then it was a little more challenging and difficult, but I think today we're in a different place. Thank God for that. So we have, whether it's HR or PR and some of these companies, they're making sure that they don't get into these kind of situations because bad publicity. Freeze up. We lost you, doctor. Bishop, further, further my education. Oh, there we I go. had to make sure, you know what? <laughs> Let me get a plan here because this is just not working out for me at all. Yeah. So I had to further my education, up my game a little until I was comfortable enough to say, you know what, if I walk away from this to the, today, I can walk into this tomorrow. If I can walk away from this, I'm good. So that's what I've done. But again, today it's a little different. It's a little bit more easier, not to say the challenges aren't there. You know, so my question, maybe at Dr. Session can sometime in the panel, uh, on the program, speak to the fact that the, the idea that, what do you do? It's like I was stuck, two, three kids, one car, babysitter, and, and the whole nine, and you have to put up with the nonsense if you wanna keep a roof over your head. So yeah, the challenges are great, but I'm thanking God that we're in a different day today, and we don't, not to say it's not here. Yes, right. it's there, but at least we have options, so I'm thankful for that. Okay, thank you very much, man of God. Okay, this time we'll be asking uh, Pastor Richard McKenzie to weigh in. All right, good night, everyone. Bless you, Bishop Scott. Amen to the panel, to Dr. Session. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. 
Amen. I enjoyed everything that everyone has to say. Um, I'm going to be looking at it from two different standpoints, the standpoint of the employee and also the standpoint of the employer, because right now I'm actually in the place of the employer. So I want to make sure I touch that as well. So for employees, the first thing that I would say is know your rights. Know your rights. And, uh, when you're a hire, you're not just hired to be anybody's servant or slave. You have rights as well. There's something called the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment um, Opportunity Commission. And what they do is it's a federal agency that makes sure that federal laws are observed in the workplace. In other words, that the employer cannot discriminate against you for whatever reason. And not only that, but they also protect you that if you are supposed to go and complain or make a complaint, I should say, that the employer cannot retaliate against you because that's one of the biggest issues that employees face, you know, the fear of, yeah, the, the fear of re retaliation. It's, it's, it's the truth. And especially as Bishop Wallace was just saying, you know, if you're not financially secure and you know that you have children, you have rent, you have all these things, the first thing that you think about is if I lose this job, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? And these are, these are, these are real things. These are real things. But there, 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 there's this, there are agencies that have been created to protect us against such retaliation. Does it always work when we go to them? That's a different story. Because we heard uh, Dr. Francis's um, you know, testimony about what happened when she went to HR. You know, they're set up to help us, but not all the time do they actually help us. Second thing, as everyone has said already, speak up. Speak up. If, if something is happening to you, speak up. Listen, uh, we've talked about racial discrimination and gender discrimination, but another discrimination that I specifically faced many moons ago was age discrimination. Especially when you're young in a workplace, they try to take advantage of you because they feel that you're naive. And especially, as I said to you guys, when you have a car, they send you here, there, and everywhere. I, I recalled amen, some years ago when I was like 18, 19, I was working at a specific place and I was promoted to be uh, a store manager. I was the youngest store manager in that division. And guess what they did with me? They sent me to every store, Manhattan, Staten Island, Jersey, all over the place to clean up other people's mess. My mom used to hate it. My mom used to say, why you don't quit the job? Why you don't? I, but you know, you're young, you have a sense of pride. You don't want to. You know, you know, you don't want your parents to think that you can't handle yourself. I know they're listening right now and I know I'm going to hear it, <laughs> but you know, you don't want them, amen, to think that you can't handle yourself. So I went with it. And what happened was the more time I spent in everybody else's store is the less time that I got to spend in my store. And then my store started to go under. And then all of a sudden it was time for DM visits. And I had to spend 48 hours consecutively in the store, in the store in the store facing and making sure that everything was right for the visit. Why? Because I was naive and I was young and I had bills to pay. So I did not want to speak up and they took advantage of me. So it is important. Listen, especially in 2020, you have a voice, speak up. Something going on, speak up about it. Next thing, contact HR. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Francis, but we should still contact <laughs> HR, even if it might not work out in our favor. We should make sure that we contact HR. And if some of you, you have unions, contact your union, speak to your union representative and tell them what's going on, but speak up. Now, as an employer, because right now my title is corporate manager of a dermatology uh, practice right here in the uh, New York City area, we're in every borough. As employers, we have to do our part as well. We've been talking about continuing the conversation. It's, it's, it's in the workplace as well. If I'm a black manager, I believe that it is my duty when I, when I meet up with my colleagues, because we always have these dinners, these free dinners that we go to, to smooth one another. Listen, we, we have to bring up the conversation, especially right now it's a hot topic, bring up the conversation. Not only that, training. There should be anti-racism training in the workplace. I just had to endure sexual harassment training a couple of months ago where I had to learn that there's more than uh, the two genders that I learned when I was a baby, which was male and female. I just had to learn a whole different definition <laughs> of genders that I didn't even know existed 
So now, I'm, yeah. I, when I started it, I said, all right, genders, male and female. They started to say a whole bunch of stuff. I, my eyes was like this. <laughs> the same way, <laughs> the same way that they can teach us these things, the same yeah. way that they could train yeah. us, amen, yeah. to be racially sensitive in the workplace. And not only that, as employers, I think it's important that we also cultivate diversity. If you're, if you're putting teams together, don't just put all the Jamaicans together or all the black people together or all the white people together. Come on, try to intermingle people so that they can get to know each other, that they can work together because that helps to, to, to break up all the stereotypes because let's be honest, we all have these little stereotypes that we have in our heads about other races. And once we get to know each other, those stereotypes will start to diminish. So that's what I have to say on that topic. Thank you, men of God. Um, I want to put a question to Dr. Session and to the panel as well. Okay, and the question is this, and uh, this is just piggybacking off the back of um, Pastor McKenzie. What steps can we take to eliminate racism from the workplace? What steps can we take to eliminate racism from the workplace? Who's well, we? Dr. Mm -hmm. Session, please go ahead. That's a good question. Who's we, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first and foremost, education is key, right? Because, um, you know, much like Pastor McKenzie said, um, all of managers, all leadership should be trained on what is unconscious and implicit bias, what is microaggressions, you know, how do stereotypes impact hiring decisions, promotional decisions. Um, so once that level and that foundational education is taking place, much like the harassment training that companies have to do or managers and employees have to do every year or every two years, depending on your state, I do agree with him that this should be part of that mandatory training. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing with my clients is having them embedded into their annual training compliance. Um, so that way it's continually reinforced and it eventually just like sexual harassment, we know, we know new genders are here <laughs> and we have to recognize that, but we also know, you know, what does harassment look like? Even if I'm a bystander and I see it, I know I can report it. Well, there's also um, bystander um, bias, right? So if you see something or hear something happening, you should know that you can report it or you can step up and address it. So the education is going to be key from the leadership, the top of the leadership, all the way down to the frontline employees. And, you know, I've told, I, I've talked to my son about this. He's 24. He was out there protesting here in LA. And I said, you know, I may not see the work that I've done and what you guys are doing right now in terms of changing the dynamic of the conversation in the workplace in my generation. I hope I do. But if you think back to the civil rights leaders, you know, we just lost uh, John Lewis and, um, you know, C.T. Bill, um, what's his name? Villian, right? I can't mm -hmm. remember yeah. his last name, but, you know, they, they got to see a black president, but the problems are still here, right? So there's still work to be done. So I think it's gonna take time, you know, hopefully we'll see it in the next generation, Gen Y, the millennials, and if not then maybe even Gen Z, because that generation is the most culturally and socially and ethically diverse group to enter the workforce. And they have zero tolerance for the stuff that we tolerate and that our, our parents and grandparents tolerated. Um, so I think that they're bringing a new voice to the table. That's gonna start the conversation and it's gonna continue and they're gonna call things out, you know, whether it's right there in the workplace or on social media, um, this whole cancel culture is being driven by them and the actions that they're taking right now. So they know the power of their voice. They see the impact of it pretty quickly. And you see a lot of companies have come up and apologize and addressed their issues. And, you know, it's because this generation is forcing, you know, pushing the envelope. So I think that's what's going to help with eliminating racism in the workplace. Now, we're going to have certain institutions, you know, whether it's government agencies, because like I said, I do some work with them they're gonna be slower on the path, right? So they're gonna be a little slower to drag along. But again, as this new workforce comes in, they're gonna be forced to change. You know, we had to change the way we do business because millennials started entering the workforce. You know, that's why a lot of cubicle walls came down. You had open workspaces because they came in the workplace and they said, hey, we need to be part of a team. We need to have this interaction with each other. This is what we're used to. Companies bend it and they started doing open floor you know workspaces and changing their benefits offering pet benefits and stuff like that so again because they forced the conversation to change that's what's going to th i think going to take place bishop williston what steps do you think we can take to 
eliminate racism from the workplace? Well, again, I think what we're doing right now is having a conversation. We at least need to start there. Um, I've always looked at it from this, from the angle, or from the perspective of who really benefits from racism in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Who really benefits? Definitely not me. Um, if no one was benefiting from it, why are they still doing it? Why is it still going on? You know, when you talk about discrimination, racism against people of color, I was just wondering, and again, I'm not an expert, I was just wondering if, let's say, they, 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 their desires to keep us at a certain pay grade so that we don't accumulate generational wealth. Because if I'm just struggling to pay regular bills, no saving, no investment, no nothing. And they, I've had, oh Lord, I've had situations where when I go for review, numbers are great. I've worked in management, numbers are great. Only that, numbers are great. They find some, re they, and I'm saying, how do you do this? The numbers are, the numbers, I make my bosses make money, buy that new boat, get a second boat. And they're telling me, well, again, I was naive. I'm in my thirties, I had no clue. And so then they benefit because looking at the bigger picture, why do they want me to get a boat? Why do they want me to improve myself? That's not what they want. They want to keep me at a, at a level where I'm a slave, so to speak, and make them make money. So again, who does it really benefit? And what's the bigger picture? Generational wealth for the whites or the Caucasians, it's, it's a way of life. For us, it's primarily non-existent because again, if I can barely manage savings, investment, college funds for my kids. No, I'm just trying to survive. So I'm just wondering if there's a bigger picture to that. Mr. Um, McKenzie, you touched on it, um, eliminating racism in um, your answer. Um, but let's just stretch it a little further. What do you really, really think we can do to get rid of this thing in the workplace? Key word is rid. Hmm. Word is rid. I, <laughs> Lord have mercy. I think we've been having this conversation for about 400 years now, probably more. Um, I don't know if we can get rid of it, Bishop, ah. but what we can do is do our best is what we've been saying, continue the conversation, spread the awareness, educate ourselves, educate others, and see what can be done. I mean, as Dr. Session said, we may not see it in our lifetime. I mean, I know Bishop Walsh is gonna get me for this one. I might be a little younger <laughs> than, than some, of it, some of you, amen. But I, I still don't know if I will see it in my lifetime, but I, we have to encourage our children to speak up, to do what they're doing because the, if you can just touch one person, that person can touch another person, that person can touch another person. And eventually, even if we don't get rid of it, hopefully it'll get better. Okay, thank you much. Dr. Heather Francis. Well, honestly, Bishop, uh, racism is a global issue as we know. It's been going on for so many years. And the problem is many times it's being ignored, uh, but the problem is staying silent. If you experience it, say something. If, you know, make your voice heard because people are listening and they will respond. How are they responding? Well, we're hearing about it. We heard about it from Dr. Session and also uh, Pastor McKenzie. There are new things that are being Im implemented in the workplace that does make a difference. Also, uh, we need to understand that our voice does matter. And I believe that even though we we may have struggled, people like myself, we've struggled, but I still believe that we're successful because we've survived. You know, we have survived these experiences. We're still here that we can talk about it. And um, I particularly want to address um, Black women. I believe that Black women in leadership, whether it be in our organizations or in the community, uh, in the workplace, if we don't have a voice, half the world is, is not being impacted. So I believe that we have to continue to have a voice. I believe that we need to continue to empower one another. What we're doing tonight is a great example of that. 
you know, we brought someone on the line who is an expert in that field. She's written not just one book, not just two books, not just three books, but she's written four books now on the matter. Uh, number one, get your career life in order. Second book, the little book of motivation and inspiration. Third book, uh, Inside the Revolving Door. And now she's pre-selling the fourth book, which is what we're talking about tonight, Working While Black, A Woman's Guide to Stop Being the Best Kept Secret. When we empower one another, when we encourage one another as, as minorities, as African-Americans, as women, as people of color, when we promote each other, that is a part of breaking down those walls of separation and prejudice. So this is the beginning. As both of you have said, we may not be here when the complete result of what we're doing you know, evolves or manifests, but this is a part of it. So if we can continue to do that, then guess what? That's success right there. And I believe that's a, that's a great part that we can do. Okay, thank you much. Apostle Roas. Oh, I'm a prisoner of hope. <laughs> I believe, I'm a believer. You know, um, we have been talking about this for the past how many years? Hundreds of years. But um, somebody once said changes it's hard in the beginning, it's messy in the middle, but it's rewarding in the end. Ah. That's good. And um, change is coming. And in 2008, we had the first African-American president. Didn't mean everything was resolved. <laughs> and I don't think there's one thing that we can point our finger and say, this is the reason. If we press this button, racism will go away. When Kaepernick took the knee, folks look at him as a troublemaker. I've seen cops took knees. I've seen politicians took knees. When the black lives started, we thought they were just a bunch of black thugs. <clears throat> but now companies are recognizing them. The Me Too movement. So I think people are being vocal and speaking up more than ever before. Can I say something? I'm not going to be prophetic tonight, but can I say something? <laughs> go ahead, Apostle. Can I go ahead, Dr. Francis? Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> I, I think, you, you, did, you, did you know that Joe Biden, the, 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 the Democratic nominee, who quite possible could win this election, he declared that his running mate will not only be a woman, but a woman of color. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> so I'm saying, I'm saying, what about he become, on the 21st of January, he's sworn in, a vice president as a woman of color. And Joe Biden in 2024 will be in his early 80s. Let's say he, he don't run again. The incumbent can be a woman of color. Hallelujah. Seeking. <laughs> hey, don't look at me start it now. Seeking to be the president of the United States of America. So in 2008, we had a black man. Yes. Quite possible in 2024, we could have a woman of color in the White House. Prophesy, prophesy. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we black people built the White House, so there's nothing wrong with us. Time to change, time to change that name. Dying. The White House. I'll change the name. <laughs> now, one of the things I would like to say and say candidly is this, that uh, Black people did not create the problem of racism in the workplace. So please don't expect us to resolve it alone, seeing that we did not create it. Now, the question that I would like to put to the panel is this, okay? What do we say to people that's people of color like us that sees racism and we don't confront it because as you know there are people that see it and experience it but they don't confront it what do you say to people like those i'm putting this to the panel in general dr session would you like to weigh in on that 
Yeah, I think someone said it earlier, you know, silence equals acceptance or agreement, right? So you're complicit, you know, so you can, and I saw someone ask a question if racism is just a black or white thing. It's not, it can even be within the races, um, you know, because we have stereotypes about our own people, right? Mm -hmm. We have colorism, we have hair issues, we got everything going on. So I think if you're, if you're a person of color and you see someone else who's marginalized, that may not even be from your same ethnicity or your same gender and you don't speak up, then you're just as guilty and complicit as the person who did it or who said it. Um, so I think we all have a responsibility. I tell people, you know, people talk about white privilege, but mm. I tell my clients, we all have privilege at different moments and times in our lives. And we all have power at different moments and times in our lives. You know, I have privilege as a woman sometimes. I have privilege as a black woman sometimes. I have privilege as a light-skinned black woman sometimes. So I have to honor that when I see or hear someone saying something that is affecting another marginalized person, that's my time to be an ally. So everyone's talking about this branded word ally and I tell them ally is a noun, it's a, it's a verb, not a noun, it takes action. So you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Like John Lewis said, you know, he wasn't scared of dying because he knew he had to put his body out there to fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. So I think it's impossible for us, no matter what your ethnicity is to say that, you know, oh, it doesn't impact me. Yes, it does in one way, shape or form, even if it, because we're all humans at the end of the day. So it's, it's something that we all really need to look in the mirror about and really think about what part are we even playing in this and what can we do to really help change the narrative and the language and the conversation because we can't all play victim. We just can't, we can't sit back and say, oh, it's not my problem, it's for the white people to fix it. No, we all have a part to play in this. And it's true what you said earlier, we shouldn't have to live it and defend it. I agree with that. So yeah, some people need to educate themselves first before they come asking a bunch of questions. We shouldn't have to do the heavy lifting. But I think we also have a responsibility to have teachable moments every single moment that we can. Thank you much. Bishop Ulista, what can we say to those that do not confront racism? Well, I just thought about, I wanted to pose this to Dr. Uh, Dr. Session in regards to the situation with Dr. Heather, with her HR manager, she was powerless. What do you do when she, she's not able, what, look at the advice she gave her. I mean, she was powerless. Number two, we spoke a little while ago, um, well, we didn't really speak, but in regards to whistleblower, look what's happening with whistleblowers today. I mean, this is at the highest of the height. And look what's, so are we damned if we do or damned if we don't, excuse my language? I mean, what, what do we do? Before, before she responds, can, Dr. Session, did you read the, the comment ju that just came through on the chat? Oh, from, no. Yeah, because that ties into what Bishop Wollaston is just saying. I didn't see, can you read it please? So the comment is from Dornell Reed. A month ago, I complained to HR about the racist treatment from my then supervisor and manager. I was the only black individual in that department. Unfortunately, I was removed and placed in another area to work. I spoke up and they retaliated against me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, what, I don't know her situation or position. 30 years ago for me, it was two or three kids, one car, rent, the whole nine. What do we do? Yeah, and there are a lot of people in that situation right now today. So it's not just 30 years ago, it's right now, right? So we all, uh, for the most part, live in paycheck to paycheck. And like you said, there's no savings, no generational wealth. We can't depend on friends and family because they're in the same situation that we're in. But what I do tell people is if it starts to affect you mentally and emotionally and physically, then that's a decision that you really have to decide, is this really the place for me? Maybe it means that you start planning your exit very, very quickly. You don't have to let your left hand know what the right hand's doing. And I tell people, you know, let your current employer be your silent investor while you go and look for another job. Now in this market, it's a little more difficult because we are impacted by all of these companies not necessarily hiring. The ones that are, are usually the, um, the what they call frontline employees right now, right? So not everyone wants to do that type of work, I get it. But I think there's other ways for us to really think about planning our exit. You mentioned that you didn't have um, the degree or the education at the time as well. That's a lot of people in that same situation. But fortunately right now, a lot of organizations are offering free certifications and they're offering opportunities for people to learn new skills that's gonna help them be successful in this new age that we're going into around technology, where a lot of the skills that people used in the past are starting to fade away because technology is taking their place. 
And so now we have to think about, I need to upskill. How do I do that? Well, you go and research and you find out what types of opportunities are out there that are minimal or no cost because there are plenty of companies are doing it. And in particular for communities of color right now, they're throwing money at us. So I say, take advantage of what's out there. And again, keep your job. Don't let them know what you're doing, <laughs> but go out there and get as much education or certifications that you can that can help you transition and pivot to another job where you won't have those types of experiences. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a tough decision. It's definitely a personal one, but at the end of the day, we all have a choice. I've been in some tough ones myself and making lots of money and decided it wasn't the right thing for me and I had to leave and left without any type of security blanket or anything to really land on. But at the end of the day, it all worked out. So sometimes our own fear is going to stop us from even willing to being willing to take that chance to see what else is out there. And, you know, that's not to say you're not going to encounter problems at the next job. I most certainly did. But you learn how to navigate through that. And then you learn how to set yourself up for success going forward. Um, Dr. I share with you guys before. I'm sorry. Dr. No, Sessions, ahead. the person that just made the comment in regards to um, the racist, Retaliation. racist she's uh, experiencing on her job, would you suggest that she further this with the EEOC? I would actually. I think if there's no one above the HR that she can go to, let's say whoever HR reports to, and nowadays, again, I don't know what industry she's in or what company she's in, a lot of companies are being a lot more sensitive about this because they don't want the negative PR. I think someone mentioned that too. So there is an opportunity now for us to have the voice that we didn't have before. And I say we should use it. So maybe that means writing a letter like, um, uh, what is it, Apostle, I think Rojas said oh. that he wrote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so perhaps you write a letter to the CEO and you let them know what happened. Now you want to make sure you dot in your I's and you crossing your T's because if they come back and they go through your file and they find out that there were some other issues here, that's going to turn bad on you. I'm telling you that from an HR experience. So make sure your stuff is clean and clear and then you take it to the next level. And if you still don't get results, then you go to the EEO or maybe you do it in conjunction of, oh, and by the way, I want to let you know I filed a complaint with EEO. That's going to get a lot of people's attention. Just like, just like when Rojas did it on his job. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Heather Francis, would you like to weigh in? What do we do to people or what do we say to people that refuse to confront? Um, honestly, I agree with everything that's been said. If you're not saying anything, um, it just means that you agree with what's going on. And it, it means you agree with everything that's happening. And how can you agree to injustice as a human being? I, I just... I can't relate to that, uh, especially people of color. So I believe that people of color, we need to stand together more. I, I said it before about empowerment. The greatest thing that we can do as, as a people is build one another up, build each other up. And the Bible even says that, that we should, we should look at others and esteem them higher than ourselves. But do we really practice that? That's actually a great practice to do in life because when you lift others up, you feel good about yourself. So why not do that when it comes to the workplace, when it comes to injustices, talk about people who are being marginalized, especially black women, uh, because we have a double burden. We're marginalized based on our gender, uh, based on our race sure. and ethnicity. So it's like we get a double whammy when it comes to being marginalized in the workplace. And unfortunately, it has a domino effect. When you don't say something or help someone else who's going through, as women, we carry a burden of uh, having the effects physically. We have higher level of stress, uh, anxiety, depression. And then, but yet still, we have to be these wonderful mothers. I'm a single mom, so I've been doing it for over 25 years. And then we have, and if you're a wife, oh, you still have to be the wonderful, perfect wife on top of the stress and the anxiety. So overall, it affects all of us. When it, you know, when it comes right down to it, there's a lot of areas of your life because then now your family life is being affected. So not saying something and not doing something is an injustice to each other. Apostle Roas. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said an investment in education gives the best return. Mm. And um, going back to the word of God, it says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Mm. And um, information is the greatest commodity on planet Earth. We need to be informed. Um, you know, as people of color, we can't just cuss and shout. We got to um, use the, the power of the pen. And sometimes we got we to gotta keep on speaking and keep on fighting. I mean, the, the, the girl said she spoke and, and, and people retaliate. But I think in this, in this time and era, you know, uh, 
as Dr. King said, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Mm. Even, even, even with racism in the workplace, but even what, what has been going on in this climate and this era, um, some of the, even I may say the white evangelical, uh, they are not even saying anything. Mm. You know, um, you know, today is for me, tomorrow's for you. They, they're not saying, I mean, some are speaking up more. And, and you know, even the church, you know, we, we, like I said, we are having this conversation, not because we are, we are angry black people, but it, it's, it's relevant. It needs to be discussed it, yes, we, it to have a conversation. And I'm not saying, yeah, we, we could swing for the fences, but like I was saying, let's just get a single. In NFL, let's, let's get the first down. In, in basketball, let's, let's, let's just get a basket. We, we got to keep chipping away. We can't stop. We can't get frustrated. We can't get fatigued. We can't throw up our hands in despair and say, I'm done. So if we could be smart in how we handle things and be informed and be educated, I think it will help us. You know, um, so, so, so I believe we, we, we can't stop speaking. Sometimes we, we feel like it falls on deaf ears, but we, we got to be informed and speak and use our voice as a tool, as a weapon. Thank you much, man of God. Pastor Richard McKenzie. Praise God. Just to piggyback on what everybody has been saying, speak up. Reach out to your labor boards, as it's being said right now. Contact the EEOC. Listen, stop being, stop being somebody's beating stick. Especially right now, me personally, I, I look at it this way, that a lot of time we talk about uh, physical abuse, but sometimes the, men, not even sometimes, the mental and the verbal Emotion. abuse and the emotional abuse outweighs the physical abuse at times. Like, can you imagine, as Dr. Francis says, not only that, but you're, 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 you are so overwhelmed with what's going on that you even go home and probably take it out on your family, you take it out on your wife, you take it out on your children, all because of what's happening. I can't live like that. I can't live like that. So if it, if it gets to the point where it doesn't change for me personally, I know it's time to leave because listen, if one door closes, listen, we're, we're a practical bunch, but we're also a church, we're also a faith believing bunch. If one door closes, I believe that God is going to open a better door for me. David said in his word, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor received begging bread. And I'm not saying that the one time something is done to you, you just jump ship. I'm not saying that. Go through all your options. Do whatever you have to do. But if it is persistent, listen, you see this mind that I have? You see this heart that I have? I can't carry any extra heavy weight on me. I, can't, <laughs> I, cannot. I have four children to come home to. I have a wife to come home to. I cannot come home and my head feeling like it's going to explode. No, no, no. Not me. Not no way. If it's getting to that point, I believe that God will open another door for me. Pastor McKenzie, you have a wife, you have four children, and you're pastoring two locations, sir. Yes, you sir. do have a lot on your plate. I want to put this question to the panel, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Session, of course, to weigh on in. How can we create an environment of psychological safety in the workplace? Now, mark my words. How can we create an environment of psychological safety? in the workplace because sometimes you can be at a place working but honestly your mind really isn't there so how can we really create an environment of psychological safety in the workplace dr session would you please well, I'm a firm believer in healthy boundaries. So <laughs> again, much like Pastor McKenzie said, if this is a place that's impacting you emotionally, physically, you can't stop thinking about it in a negative way. Um, you know, that leads to trauma and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, again, I was a victim of that and I thought I could change them. I could prove to them. I could work harder, faster, stronger than the next person and they'll love me. Well, that's not necessarily what happened, right? I wore myself out to the uh, extent of my own health and it wasn't good, it wasn't healthy. 
So I think if we're experiencing something like that, again, it's time to have that healthy, honest conversation with yourself to say, is this really the place for me? I don't care how many years you've been there. I don't care how long it took for you to get to that position. There's another organization that will value you and what you bring mm -hmm. to the table and probably pay you more. So, you know, that's that's the part that you, you know, like he said, it's about the faith, right? Like sometimes it's a side of a mustard seed, but you gotta, you gotta believe in it and be willing to take that chance for yourself. You got to put yourself first because at the end of the day, I'm telling you, I've sat around these tables with these executives for many, many years and I still do it as a consultant. And at the bottom of the day, what matters to them is the mighty dollar, you know? So yes, they may think you may think they love you and they all know your name, but at the end of the day, when they have to cut costs, the only thing they see is a piece of na a name on a piece of paper and they're just going to slice right through it and keep on going without any emotional attachment to that. So just know that, um, there is no loyalty in business. <laughs> you know, it's disheartening for some to hear that, but it's the reality of it. Um, yes, companies are now having a new awakening to their own conscience about, you know, how they've treated employees in the past and what can they do about the ones they currently have and the ones that they eventually want to recruit. So there's a window of opportunity there for things to change. But until they do, to protect your own psychological welfare, you have to set those healthy boundaries and then know when enough is enough, just walk out the door. Dr. Okay. Sessions, I'm three years away from retirement, getting the uh -huh. big full package. Mm. What do I do? Yeah, take a leave of absence. <laughs> 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 Don't quit. <laughs> no hypothetical, by the way. That's yeah, but that's real. It's that's ways to work the system. <laughs> Okay. You know, I've seen people go out on FMLA. I've seen people go out on workers' comp to ride that wave to get them to that date, right? So they haven't been terminated. They're not, um, they haven't quit. They're still an employee. And at the end of the day, they still get, the, I've seen it done. And I'm like, what can we do with this employee? How can we get them off payroll? We can't. They're protected. So, yeah. Use your options. Wow. Use your options. Oh, man. Gotcha. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Heather Francis, how can we create an environment of psychological safety in the workplace? Um, honestly, Dr. Sessions hit the nail on the head. Um, I also think that it would be great when you're looking for, this is mostly for the younger people, that when you're looking for a place of employment that you try and see if you can research wherever you're looking to get employed, that they have programs, they have things that are put in place for your psychological or emotional health. Um, I know I worked for quite a few companies in my lifetime and they, very few of them had it, but they did have something in place. They had resource numbers, resource hotlines and departments that you could call if you needed help or if you needed uh, emotional problems, psychological problems. So there are, in, there are things that are put in place in companies that can help you. Uh, but at the end of the day, you are your own, you know, greatest advocate. You advocate for yourself. And so you have to be able to recognize and know when you're, you're not being valued for your true worth. So you have to know what your self-worth is. And once you know what that is, like, listen, I've always been a self-advocate and I believe that I'm not going to allow anyone or be in any environment that devalues me or what I know my worth is. So it, it's very personal. I believe that your psychological and emotional health, it is personal and you need to take ownership of that and be responsible for your own self and know when to, you know, when to fold. Amen. Is there anyone else on the panel that would like to weigh in on that? Very quickly, um, yes. from the employer's perspective, because again, I told mm -hmm. you I am one, we have to approach things from a human standpoint. I know Dr. Session just said that, you know, a lot of times when we have employees, we consider them as numbers and we just look at the, you know, the monetary value. And it's true, sad, but it's true, especially during this crisis right now, when you're trying to cut costs because you can't uh, manage your overhead, you know, you, you, you look at people as uh, unfortunately numbers, but uh, I believe that as employers, we should listen to our employees. We should be empathetic. Like I literally had an employee some months before the pandemic come to me and she was breaking, she broke down, broke down. And I said, listen, just sit here, just talk, just talk. She had so much going on at home, so much going on with her baby father, so much going on with this one and that one. 
that she was literally at work but couldn't get anything done. I said, listen, if you need some time off, take some time off. I'm not gonna fire you, I'm not gonna let you go. You do what you have to do. You get your mental back together and when you're ready to come back, you come back. Is every employer like me and is every uh, company like my company? No, unfortunately not, unfortunately not. But if there are any employers listening, please just listen to your employees. They are human beings too. Please, they are. Dr. Session, I've, I've had situations just like Pastor McKenzie's experience with the young lady. Again, this is 30, 35 years ago. I was told, keep your home business at home and we're here to work. Again, this was 35 years ago, two, three kids. You stop between a rock and a hard place. I know it's a different age right now, but my supervisors weren't as sympathetic as, as Pastor McKenzie say, okay, let's talk, let's talk. No, no, keep your home bit, because again, you are so correct. The, the money is bottom line. You make the numbers for them every month. Yeah. And if you make 100,000 this month, you ain't making no 99 next month. It's gotta be 110, up, higher, higher, higher. So the stress factor, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and you know, you're right about um, that was one of the things that, uh, especially being head of HR, that I would sit across the table and tell people. So <laughs> I was guilty. Um, but <laughs> things have changed. You're right. Things have changed, right? And in particular now over the last four months, I've, I've talked to many, many organizations and you know, been a keynote on different events where the message is that the workplace invaded our home now, right? We didn't invite work to our house. We didn't say, come on in and follow me 24 seven, be here seven days a week because of this pandemic, right? So most people, a lot of people are working remotely. So that has really humanized the workplace in ways that it never has before. Well, now managers are much more empathetic. They're much more flexible because they realize that, you know, these people got a lot going on at home. They're starting to get a peek into it. I mean, you guys are getting a peek into my home right now, right? My husband's in the other room <laughs> making noise. I had to tell him to close the door. You know, those types of things are happening all the time around the world. So a lot of the information that's coming out now is when and if we do go back to the workplace, it's going to be different because we've met each other in ways we never have before. We had these barriers up about who we were when we walked through those doors from eight to six or nine to five or 10 to whatever. And now we come back to the workplace. That doesn't go away. You still know like what kind of pets I have, what my roommates look like, my spouse, my kids, what they act like when they're on camera. And now we have a different type of relationship. We also told people don't talk about race, politics and religion in the workplace. And now that's all we're talking about is race, politics and religion in the workplace. You know, respectfully, hopefully, and sometimes very passionately, but the conversations are happening. So now it's really about you're bringing your true authentic self to the workplace now. And that means your problems are gonna follow you. Plus we have this with us all day. So people can find us, we can get information just like that at the snap of a dime and react. Maybe our kids immediately need us or our spouse or significant other does. And now things are happening in the workplace. And also, by the way, I got to deal with this right now too. So those types of things are really starting to change the way people show up in the workplace. Again, I think it's gonna, when people go back to, the, to their offices, I know some people are already, but when we really can go back to, you know, in the workplace, it's gonna really be different. I'm really convinced about that. Okay, Apostle, would you like to weigh in? No, I just want to say that um, I had a couple of people um, was frustrated with their jobs and um, wanted to quit. And in this pandemic season, it's hard to quit your job to get something else because so many places are closed. And, you know, I remember personally when I went through what I was going through on my job, it was so demoralizing. It was so depressing. It was such a stressful situation to deal with. And I think when companies create a good working environment, I think workers can be more productive. I think they can even, the, the company uh, more than likely would gain from a, a happy worker. I believe a happy worker is a more productive worker. So when the when the when the environment is, is, is healthy and, and peaceful and, and there's harmony, I, I think we can all perform better. But when you're performing under stress, it's it's such a hard thing. You know, I mean you spend so much time at work. Some people spend more than 40 hours a week at the workplace. 
And if, 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 the, if, the, if the environment is toxic, somebody wants to, you can, you can even bring it home to your house. It can affect your marriage. It can affect your health. So, you know, like Khalil Gibran says, work is love made visible. And, and work will be beautiful. You know, people should, I, I, I want to go to work this morning. I can't wait to go to work. I got friends there. Uh, you know, we got good bosses there, good supervisors. But when you're going to work to a place that is toxic and there's tension and there's blackmail and there's racial tension and backbite and gossip, I mean, it, it's, it's such a, it's not a healthy environment. Yeah. I'm not really into numbers, but um, let me just throw this question out. How common is racism in the workplace? How common is racism in the workplace? Is it everywhere? Talk to me. I don't know if it's <laughs> everywhere. I think it depends on, you know, uh, what kind of culture they've cultivated, right? So mm. that's going to drive it. You know, Peter Drucker, he's a, a big HR expert and educator, and he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if the company's culture fosters that from the top usually or somewhere in the middle with some management level, then it's going to exist, especially if it's not addressed and there's no uh, zero tolerance policy, which a lot of companies are starting to put into place now is a zero tolerance policy on racism. I've never seen that before. And now I think it's also about um, sometimes it's just it's so embedded that you have to wait for so many people to leave for it to go away, right? whether that's voluntarily or involuntarily. So I don't know that it's everywhere. I think there's, um, I think there's definitely microaggressions and then a lot of times there's gonna be bias. Now, is that based on racism? Probably on stereotypes more so than racism. And some of those stereotypes can be based on racism depending on their exposure or lack thereof. But um, I can't really just with a broad stroke generalize it and say that it's everywhere. Mm. Anyone else like to weigh in on that? Well, let me ask you this last question here. Are there any way that we can approach racial equity at the workplace? Racial equity. Is there a way for us to reach racial equity at the workplace? <laughs> Bishop, you Scott, Bishop Scott, you're asking these questions and you start with the we. And I'm always asking, who are the we? <laughs> we the black people, we the employee, we the employer. I just want to put a little bit of clarity. Because, who is we? Yeah, yeah who's we and us? If I'm, if I'm on the other side, what incentive do I have? Right. Well, let me rephrase that then. <laughs> this is not a reflection of your question at all. I'm just thinking out loud. I understand. I understand. Well, what do you think of that question? Is there any way that racial equity can be reached in the workplace. I, I think, think it so. can be reached if the powers to be want it to be. Yeah. Only if they want it to be, because unfortunately the burden shouldn't be on us. We didn't create this thing. And mm. for some, you know, it's like white folks who said, okay, I don't understand. So help me to help me to understand. Mm -hmm. I don't understand your plight. I don't understand black people. But can we talk? Help me to understand. What do you do? <laughs> Dr. Heather Francis. Um, well, honestly, Bishop, how can we change it? How can we? Honestly, you, you have to be at the point where you think that I can use my difference to make a difference. What do I mean by that? Um, if I'm in a different position than you, if, if I have a different perspective than you, especially if I'm in a higher position than you when it comes to being in the workplace, then I can use the different status that I have or the, you know, the different platform that I have. If I can use my difference to make a difference in your life or in our environment, it, it, you know, it's all about understanding that if you have something to bring to the, to the table and with what you have to say and your position, if you can make a difference, then do that. Use your influence. And many of us have influence in different ways. Sometimes people don't even understand or realize the impact 
that they can have and the influence mm. that they do have. Every single one of us sitting here right now on the on the on the panel, we have influence. And if you can use your influence or your difference or how you're different than me, how you can use your influence to make a difference and make things better, even for me, if you can come into my world and come into my arena and use your influence and make a difference, then so be it. The problem is a lot of times because of the systemic racism, I know I, I say it a lot, guys, but it's true because of the systemic racism that we have been born into, uh, not just us, but our, our parents, whether you be immigrants or you were born here, because of what has been put in place, many times people don't have that understanding or that realization that you really can make a difference and they don't understand their self-worth. And we have to get to the place where we realize we've been beaten down so much Let's be real about it. We have been beaten down so much that we have to continue to build, build your own self. You have to get your own pom poms, get your own, be your own cheerleader. And, you know, it's nice when you can have someone believe in you. Uh, I think it's wonderful when, when people have support systems or a husband or a wife, you know, someone who can be that helpmate and be that co-cheerleader. But what if you're like me and you got me, myself and I, and thank God I got the father, the son and the Holy Ghost. You have to know who you are and be confident in who God has created you to be and understand that your voice can make a difference. And so I have to realize that I can use my difference to make a difference. And if we can all understand that concept and that belief system, we can all, you know, be party to it and help. Thank Dr. You, Heather. Yes. Dr. Heather. Yes. I barely made it from, from Mexico, <laughs> Guatemala, wherever. I just got here. Listen, I you thought you, I got this little job. It's a janitor <laughs> position. That's the last thing I'm thinking about right now. I'm thinking about my people's back home. I'm trying to make a little something, something to send back to them. I'm going to have to deal with what I have to deal with to make it happen. What do you okay. say to that? Bishop, you are preaching to the choir. You're preaching to a woman who came from absolutely nothing. When my ex-husband left me, I had zero, zilch, nada, nothing. And I worked from having nothing, absolutely nothing, needing to find people to help me. I literally would reach out. This is where communities come in. And I know that a lot of people don't understand that the advantage to being a part of a church is great. Oh, yes. Yes. If mm -hmm. you are not in a church, find you a church, honey, because I was call I was calling up church folks saying, listen, I have to go to work for 12 to 14 hours. I have a great opportunity to work my way up in this company, but I need someone to help me watch my children. I had strangers. Of course, you have to screen them. You have to know them. Use that wonderful gift of discernment. And yes, I struggled. There were times when me and my kids, I will never again eat another Vienna sausage in my <laughs> life from the dollar store. Hello, somebody. But now I can go to the store and buy red lobster. I can go buy my own lobsters and eat them, cook them, and even go to the country where they're making the lobsters and bring them. <laughs> Somebody. Hallelujah. Don't you bet so. <laughs> so my way up, it was not easy. It was not easy, Bishop, but I did it. it. It's not impossible. What I'm saying is when you have drive and you have ambition and when you have a desire to have a better life and to get out of the little one room that I was in and I was struggling, you know what got me out of that little place? Starving. Wow being hungry. I was hungry. I was poor. I felt destitute. There were times when I was hungry. I had no food to eat. And I said, huh. I said, this is not going to be my portion. This is not going to be the rest of my life. I'm getting out of this room. I'm getting out of this limitation because this can't be all God has for me. There's got to be a better life. And I busted my butt. Yes, I struggled. I had to pinch pennies, eat from the dollar store. But guess what? I'm not eating from the dollar store no more. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 
<laughs> Dr. Francis, whatever you've been drinking, give me some. Give me some. Give me some. Don't tell us give it's Starbucks. <laughs> listen, listen, is there anyone, time is going, is there anyone else would like to weigh in? I'll weigh in on it, if you don't okay, mind. Okay, go ahead, woman of God. Thank you much. Um, so will there be racial equality? I have mm. to think back to the last 10 years of work I've done in diversity and inclusion on gender equality. And that's been the focus really for DNI for almost 10 years now. So we have more women in leadership. We have companies that have closed the gender gap um, between men and women in the workplace. And I think that, you know, we're gonna have to do the same type of work, hard work that we did with gender equality. We're gonna have to do it with racial equality. It won't happen in every single organization at the same time. It won't happen in government agencies at the same time but I think eventually it will. There's still some companies that are lagging, you know, on average Asian women make 99, 97 cents on a dollar to a white man. White women make about 87 cents to the dollar to the white man. Mm. Black women make about 65 cents to the dollar of a white man. And Latinx women make about 56 cents to the dollar of a white man. That's just here in the US. Now the World Economic Forum is saying it's gonna take 200 years globally to close the gender gap. So if that says anything, then you know how long it's going to take to close the racial gap. And that's why I said, I don't know if we're going to see it in our lifetime. But I, I give power to the next two generations and the one after that that's coming along that's going to continue carrying this torch and doing the work. I think this tolerance level is going to continue to minimize, just like it is with the gender gap, where the next generation is coming in and saying, no, we're going to talk about salary. We want to know how much my, my white male counterpart is making and I'm doing the same work. I need to be paid the same amount of money or explain to me why I'm not. So they're being bold in those conversations. We're going to have to be bold in those conversations about the racial equality as well. Dr. Tainer Session, thank you very, very much for that. Listen, time is of the essence and it's time for us to close. But I'm gonna give each one on the panel, starting with Dr. Heather Francis, then over to Bishop Williston, then to the Apostle and then to Pastor Richard McKenzie. Last but not least, Dr. Tainer M. Session, um, closing remarks. Dr. Heather Francis, you've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Amen. We are in a different season. We're in a different world now. The world is revolving. It is changing every day. I implore you to change your mind's view, change your vision view of yourself, your situation, and life. And as long as you can believe it, you can achieve it. God bless you. Thank you much. I'd like to, if possible, um, have my remark in the form of a question, and that's to Dr. Sessions, if and when she's able to. So the question is, well, here's one of her um, statements. Change small and change often. If you can, when you get your opportunity, elaborate on that, I'll be more than happy. Thank you again for taking the time to be with us. Apostle? Well, I just want to say thank God tonight. It was a beautiful session. I enjoy every bit of it. and. Um, it, it, it's just so important to address the issues. I don't think one conversation is going to change everything, but we got to be aware and conscious of it and, and um, talk about it and let our voices be made heard. Thank you. Pastor Richard McKenzie. Very quick. Speak up, know your worth, know your God, and let's create change. God bless. Dr. Session, it's all up to you. Okay, <laughs> so I'll respond real quick. So change, much like Apostle Roja said, is hard in the beginning, messy in the middle, and worth it in the end. And it takes little bite size. Sometimes you got to take baby steps to see the change. We have to constantly evolve because what got you there won't keep you there. And that's one of the things that I tell my clients and people are looking for new jobs and new promotions is that, yeah, you did a great job up to now. Now it's time to really stretch yourself to the next level. So that's where change often and um, you know, change. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why it's so important to just keep that in mind. Thank you, Doctor Sessions. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much. A job well done. I just want to take time right now just to um, promote our T-shirt that we have. Oh yes, our T-shirt, and that is so <laughs> important. The Bishop's Corner. T-shirt. Oh, yes. Uh, it's on sale now. You can go to philipreed.org. philipreed.org.
org. Okay, and that is so important. The next time we meet, I'm hoping that we'll all be wearing that t-shirt. Well, I just want to thank the panel tonight for a job well done and Dr. Tana Session. We just want to say thank you very, very much for coming on tonight and being such a blessing. Now, I know you can't hear this, but can we just put our hands together for her and give God a great God bless you for her presence tonight. Thank, thank you. you very, very much. We also want to thank um, Phoenix National Business Group. Amen for a job well done. This program will be online every Thursday evening from 8 until 9.30. Our goal is to empower you to prosper even as your soul prosper. God bless you all. And I just want to thank God for Philip Reed, who is the producer, who does a fantastic job. He is worth his weight in gold. Come on, put your hands oh. together for Master Philip Reed. We thank God for him. Listen, God bless you from the Bishop's Corner. Looking forward to see you next week, same time. God bless you.